Welcome to the last lecture for the basics of space flight and this is where we discuss chapter 10 space colonization. Before we get into the specifics here I'd like to just say that um, what we're about to talk about in this lecture <clears throat> is definitely among the most speculative stuff that we've discussed so far and so you should probably think about it as uh, things that may occur someday uh, and uh, if we are able to one day gain a more permanent presence in outer space. So let's start by defining what is meant by colonization. We can really just extend the definition of colonization as it applies to places on the earth to the idea of colonizing space. Basically, people are migrating out from some central region to some out, outer lying region. In this case, we're talking about space. Um, what you need, though, is for your colony to become autonomous. In other words, so that it isn't really reliant upon that central region from which it came. And therein lies the challenge. So we'll talk about those challenges, but a fair question to ask first is why would we want to colonize space to begin with? There are uh, several reasons people have suggested for why uh, humans would want to colonize space. And you can decide on the merits of these as we go through. Uh, some have suggested that natural disasters or human-made disasters could make the Earth a uh, less than hospitable place to live. Uh, for example, uh, an asteroid impact could destroy uh, a great portion of of life on Earth, and if that were to happen, uh, perhaps humanity in a larger sense could survive if we had some colonies that were not located on the Earth. In the longer scale picture, eventually the Earth itself will become uninhabitable as the Sun reaches the end of its lifetime and bloats out to become a red giant star and engulfs the inner planets. Um, we have about five billion years till that occurs, uh, but you know if we're, you're playing the long game, then in that future, um, humanity would no longer be able to survive on the Earth. So, if we had um, settlements elsewhere, then humanity could potentially uh, live on past that. And then, of course, there are the typical reasons uh, people state for any kind of colonization such as real estate. You could imagine uh, wealthy people having uh, their own little space habitat uh, or the exploitation of resources. Some have suggested for example that asteroids could be mined for uh, metals and so on. Uh, the question of whether or not that is profitable, profitable is one that has yet to be answered uh, because obviously going into space itself is a very expensive endeavor and uh, you would need to be able to attain enough in the way of resources to overcome that cost and actually make a profit. Okay, so what would we need for a colony to survive? If you buy into any of those reasons as to why this might be a good idea, uh, you have to face the fact that you're going to have to overcome a lot of challenges in order for a colony to succeed. So. At a very basic level, humans are going to need some sort of life support, air, water, food, etc., protection from any kind of uh, radiation that might be out there in space. In addition, we may take it for granted, but humans really need uh, a, a constant gravitational field or some sort of um, artificial gravitational field on their bodies in order for their uh, bodies to function properly. We have evolved on this planet where there is a constant gravitational field around us of um, an acceleration rate equal to 9.8 meters per second squared and that's what our bodies are adapted to. Uh, without this there are a plethora of uh, negative health implications that can occur from muscle atrophy to bone loss to uh, bladder infections and kidney stones and all sorts of things that we may not even know about yet uh, because humans have not spent uh, long durations in space beyond about 1.2 years at, at the record.
Okay, so we need these sort of things. In addition, uh, some bare necessities beyond that are going to be materials in order to uh, maintain whatever habitat we're living in, and also energy uh, to fuel electricity, heating, cooling, and anything else that we need energy for. So to meet these needs, there are a couple different colony types that you could examine. One would involve uh, settlements on the surface of some world or, or moon, such as the moon or Mars, where uh, a colony is basically set up either on the surface or below the surface of that world. Another type of colony would be the freely floating space station in a space habitat uh, that would orbit, say, the Earth or a planet or the moon and so on. So looking at the list of needs that we have as humans to survive, let's tackle this idea of gravity first. So if you are in a space habitat, this is actually not terribly difficult, at least in principle, to supply if you are able to spin at least part of your space station because in that case you can provide a centripetal force and that will manifest as a force upward on your body, a normal force that uh, is similar to the normal force you will feel if you were standing on the surface of the earth. If you spin at just the right speed, your body will not um, be able to distinguish between uh, a 1g acceleration rate provided by a centripetal force compared to a 1g acceleration rate due to gravity on the surface of the earth. So in that sense, your body should behave in the same way that it would on the surface of the earth. Now, if you are on a surface colony, such as, for example, Mars, uh, now the situation is going to be a little different because you can't really spin Mars exactly, uh, and you, the gravity you have there is the gravity you have there. In the case of Mars, it's only about a third of the acceleration rate that we would have here on Earth, 0.33 g. And so, uh, it's unclear how much at minimum we need in terms of gravity for our, mu our muscles and our bodies to uh, not be severely negatively impacted. Um, you may need to do things such as um, what is done on the space station, the International Space Station now, where uh, you use tethers as you're seeing here, and uh, they provide a tension force against your body as you exercise. Um, this, of course, is not completely effective, but it may be something that you could do to mitigate these negative implications of being in a low-G environment. Okay, so what about life support in a space colony? This is something to think hard about, too. Uh, what you need in order to be autonomous is some sort of closed ecological system in which you're able to uh, grow your food, you're able to uh, supply the water that you need, and so on. Um, the, there's been an experiment that was done in Arizona called Biosphere 2 in which people were uh, supposed to stay there and treat it as though it's a closed uh, system. This was a failure and uh, if we can't even do it on Earth then the question is how are we going to do it um, in outer space. Of course astronauts have been reported recently to have eaten some red lettuce that they grew on the International Space Station. Yay! Um, that's hardly a sustainable kind of situation though. It's a far cry from Matt Damon uh, all on his own on Mars growing potatoes and somehow surviving. Um, we've got to think more clearly about how we can create a closed ecological system that would actually be viable. In addition, you've got to think about the fact that you need to shield humans from cosmic rays. We have a magnetic field here on Earth that diverts a lot of the charged particles that would otherwise bombard us uh, and you know, keeps us safe from those particles. You would need to provide some sort of shielding on other places where the, there is no magnetic field and no protection from these cosmic rays and other charged particles. Um, so what you'd need is some sort of mass shielding or underground structure that uh, would protect humans from these things. 
And then the question becomes, if, you, if you're able to set up all of these basics, such as life support and gravity, how do you maintain your autonomy? You need materials. What happens uh, when something breaks? How are you going to fix it? If you are in a space habitat that's freely floating, there isn't a whole lot of res in the way of resources to draw upon. Unless you're close enough to the earth that things could be shuttled into you, which then really doesn't make you entirely autonomous, um, or if you are near to an asteroid that you could potentially mine. Um, if you're on a surface, then you may be able to use the materials, the raw materials on the surface of the planet or moon. But again, even if you're mining an asteroid or, or mining materials off of the moon or Mars, how are you going to take from those raw materials and produce something that's useful? There's a whole um, host of things that need to occur in order for you to go from raw materials to some useful tools. In addition, you've got to worry about ongoing energy needs. Um, space habitats and um, space habitats may be in a good situation, especially if they're orbiting the Earth, to make use of solar arrays in order to supply some em energy to the space station. If you're on a surface settlement, you could also use solar arrays, but one thing you've got to think about is if you are further away from the sun, your uh, solar arrays are not going to be able to get as much in the way of solar radiation. Uh, for example, Mars is going to be a, a good distance away from the sun compared to the Earth, and uh, you've got to think about what your energy needs are compared to the uh, solar flux that you receive. And then you've got to think about maintaining these solar arrays. Uh, Mars, for example, has frequent dust storms. That may need that may be a problem in terms of supplying ongoing sunlight. Um, and so you may need to supplement, depending on where your colony is, you may need to supplement with some sort of other energy source. So with all of these barriers to overcome, is there anything in the near term future that is a possibility? So one thing to look at will is what will happen after the International Space Station is decommissioned. It is currently on bo borrowed time and will not uh, last forever. The, the cost of maintaining the International Space Station is roughly three billion dollars per year. Uh, so this is not necessarily uh, an expense that anyone wants to take on single-handedly. So different countries are looking at different ways of producing some sort of successor to the International Space Station. Um, NASA is really pushing for the commercial sector to take over here, uh, but other countries such as Russia, Europe, and China are thinking in terms of creating some sort of space station uh, in the later 2020s that could succeed the International Space Station and perhaps become slightly more autonomous. Um, as I said before, the longest stay of a human on one of these space habitats is uh, 1.2 years. Uh, so to be truly autonomous, you would really need to be able to stay for a longer haul than that. Uh, there is talk about returning to the moon. NASA aims to go back to the moon in 2024. Uh, followed at, after that is successful, there would be uh, plans to produce a, a lunar outpost or perhaps an orbiter in 2028 or getting into the 2030s. Some other countries are also interested in this, but this, the plans at this point um, for colonization of the moon are, are pretty nebulous. Of course, others have been looking into colonizing Mars. A uh, famous failure of that is the Mars One, uh, which was the idea of sending humans on a one-way trip to Mars. Uh, this was a for-profit organization, as it turned out, and lots of people were duped into um, trying to earn money to, to go to Mars. Uh, so NASA is looking at a manned mission that would be jumping from the moon to Mars in the 2030s and then if that's successful eventually colonizing Mars but again this is further into the future. The issues that we have uh, if if we're trying to colonize Mars are many. Uh, one involves the long duration of time that it would take to even get there. 
or communicate from the Earth to Mars. And um, Mars, as, as, we, as I mentioned, the Earth has a magnetic field. Mars has no such magnetic field. So you've got to provide protection during those long missions uh, from the charged particles that would be bombarding the astronauts. The atmosphere on Mars is carbon dioxide rich and it's lower in pressure and so it's, it's basically toxic to humans. You've got to con continually provide oxygen somehow and Mars has a lower gravity that we talked about already. Uh, so all of these things are issues. The duration of time to get there is no small issue to overcome. Um, we've talked about different trajectories that, that one could take to get to Mars, such as the Hohmann trajectory. But all of these sort of missions would involve, um, at minimum, by the time you travel there, spend some time on Mars and travel back, even the shortest stay missions that have been looked at are close to two years in duration. And the longer stay ones could be three or more years in duration. So you've got to think about um, how, how long of a time that's going to take humans and what the implications are for their safety and mental health. If you go further afield, uh, then there are other locations that you could look at for colonies within the solar system. Um, Mercury could, in principle, be similar to colonizing the moon if you were near the polar regions. Obviously, you couldn't be on the sun side of Mercury because you would be burning up, but you need some sort of um, solar energy, so somewhere near the, the polar regions could be a happy medium. Uh, some of the moons of Jupiter have been proposed and also of Saturn. You need places with water and materials that uh, could sustain human life. Of course, any of these places are going to be farther away than the moon or Mars. And um, then you've got to think even further about uh, how long it's going to take to get there and how distant you are from the Earth should something go wrong. Okay, so then further into the future, we can dream about interstellar colonization. Really, at this point, it's nothing more than a dream. Uh, I've given you the analogy that if the sun were shrunk down to the size of a dime, the closest star would be as far away as Buffalo, New York. So interstellar colonization is really, really um, unachievable at this point in time with the current technologies that we have. Nevertheless, if we were to uh, try and think about what kind of planets we would want to go to, we would want to find planets that are Earth-like. Earth-like exoplanets have been found. The issue is the distances involved, as I was alluding to. Um, the two that you see here are two examples of some of the most Earth-like exoplanets, Kepler 452b and T Garden B. Um, Kepler 452b is located 1400 light years away, so this is very remote and not something that uh, is likely to be able to be gotten to anytime, even in the conceivable future. T Garden B is 12-ish light years away, much closer. Nevertheless, with current technologies, we can't even go an appreciable fraction of the speed of light, um, and so it would take um, over it would take tens of thousands of years to um, get to hope to get to one of these worlds at minimum which is going to exceed a human lifespan so some ideas that people have pro been have proposed this is more like science fiction uh, than actual fact uh, the generation ship or the sleeper ship the generation ship is the idea of um, throughout different generations of humans uh, living out their lives on this mission to another world. A uh, sleeper ship where, would be where you go into some sort of cryogenic freezing or freezing of embryos that could later be um, thawed. But, you know, there's questions of whether or not that could survive. And it, embryos have been frozen and able to survive for years. But whether or not that can continue and whether or not they'd be able to be uh, implanted in some artificial uterus and raised from infancy is another question. You'd have to rely on artificial intelligence in order to do so. So um, all this to me boils down to this human hubris that we tend to have where we think of ourselves as so important. When you think about the entire history of the universe, uh, an analogy that has been drawn is this cosmic calendar. 
in this cosmic calendar you represent the history of the universe as one calendar year in the cosmic calendar you see that January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August, September, blah, blah, blah. All of this takes place before we even get to the, um, the dinosaurs, which don't come onto the scene until the equivalent of, uh, say, looks like about Christmas. So December 25th is when you have dinosaurs appearing. Um, humans don't appear until about mm, 9.25 at night, uh, humanoids, and then modern humans are about 11.52 at night on December 31st. So we've only been here for a mere fraction of an instant in terms of the cosmic calendar. And for us to be thinking about what's going to happen to the sun in six billion years incinerating the earth, seems a bit um, arrogant to think that we're going to still be around when that happens, given that we've only been here for the blink of an eye. Moreover, uh, maybe you've seen this recent disaster uh, with SpaceX imploding. Uh, I would encourage you to click on this link and you can take a look at the video. We can't even seem to get off the ground reliably, much less think about colonizing the cosmos. It's sort of like little tiny ants on the beach trying to take a leaf out into the waves and then thinking that we're actually getting somewhere. Um, there's a lot to overcome, and I hate to be such a downer, but the idea of space colonization to me is more uh, science fiction and something to worry about in the distant future. In the meantime, let's focus on just what we can do here on the Earth and the basics of spaceflight. So I hope you've enjoyed this class, and I wish you all the best in the future. Thank you.